Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that is challenging. It is challenging because he is talking about a matter that very few in the Western church ever give thought to. It is the subject of Christian liberty, and yet it was a source of great controversy, a, a reason for strife. One more thing in the church at Corinth, this, this troubled church that we have told you about, one more reason for friction. He's dealt with them about their divisions, their attitude, choosing one preacher over another. He's dealt with them about their, their laxness, laxness on the matter of morality. They were allowing an immoral man to stay within their membership. They were taking one another to court. They had wrong views about marriage. And he comes here and you should be familiar by now if you've been tracking with us when he says things like he's going to say in the text today. Now concerning this, he's, he's answering a question that was asked of him by this church. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. As we begin today, we will not get through this today. In fact, what all we'll be able to do today is introduce the concept, the biblical concept of Christian liberty. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen for you. because We want you to see and hear the Scriptures. That's very important to us. Our worship here, focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, driven by the Word of God. Stand with me, if you would, and follow along as I read verses 1 to 13. Again, we're introducing this today. We won't exegete this text today. We'll come back next Sunday, Lord willing, and do an exegesis of it. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We're no worse off if we do not eat, no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore... If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us open our eyes to see that we do not live in isolation from God's providence towards others. That if we have been bought with a price saved by grace through faith, placed into a local body of believers, then it's not just our lives, it is the lives of others that we must think about. And what we do and what we don't do affects them. We're either living in a way that's pointing others toward Christ, encouraging others to draw nearer to Christ, or we are living in such a way that we are a stumbling block to that and discouraging others in their pursuit of Christ. May the Lord help to see that. Thank you. Be seated. Well, in an interesting providence, we're uh, 
beginning a study on Wednesday evening, just started a few weeks, a couple weeks ago, on the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And this past Wednesday night, uh, we were in the section in uh, Romans 15, verses 5 to 7, which is what he expresses. This is what I'm praying, but it, it's, he, says, he says that as a result of what he said in chapter 14, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 4. I would encourage you to read that sometime. He is dealing there with this same topic, but from a very different angle. In Romans, he is talking about Jewish background believers who are still practicing the rituals of the ceremonial law. And he challenges them to think about, think about your brother, particularly Jewish believers who have, who have become mature and don't, don't see the need to continue in those rituals. Uh, ceremonial days, washings, but also think about the Gentile believers. So when you, when you have a discussion about Christian liberty, which is almost lost on this society today, because, because many times when people say what they're practicing is liberty, they're practicing licentiousness. So let me set up a, a boundary for you here. You've heard me, if you've been with me any time at all, you know that I think, I think of life in terms of being on the pathway and avoiding two ditches. There's always two ditches to avoid. The ditches to avoid here when thinking about, studying about, coming to embrace and practice biblical Christian liberty is the ditch of Phariseeism on the one hand, being legalistic and then superimposing your legalistic attitudes on others, or on the other hand, licentiousness. Just mistaking the fact that we are set free in Christ thinking that we are free to do whatever we please. Both of those will get you. Both of those will harm you spiritually. Living your life in either one of those ditches will find you in hell at the end. I commend to you a book. If you can get a hold of it by Walter Chantry. C-H-A-N-T-R-Y, Shadow of the Cross, Studies in Self-Denial. Now, the reason that I tell you that Christian liberty is all but lost on the West, Christ, Western expression of Christianity is because of that term self-denial. Walt Chantry says in this book, and by the way, it's a, it's a little book and it's excellent. It talks about self-denial in, in marriage, self-denial in Christian liberty. He just goes through... Uh, the Implications of Living Under the Shadow of the Cross, great book, great read. He says in there concerning Christian liberty, he says that in, in the matter of Christian liberty, when we're set free from the bonds of sin and death in Christ, that we come to experience the, the freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We're gonna, we'll see that, that verse in Galatians. But he says this big field of freedom that God has given us to roam in and to run in as Christians, has a fence around it, and it's the fence of self-denial. You cannot, in the name of freedom, do anything you want to do, particularly if your doing of it presents a stumbling block to another. So you deny yourself. The first thing Jesus said he said, you want to come after me? You want to be identified as a follower of mine? You want to become a Christ follower? First thing, what was the first thing he said? If anyone will come after me, he must deny himself. That's the first thing. First thing. It's not like that's not important with Jesus. He didn't say, you want to come after me, then do this. Oh, and by the way, if you'd like to, no. You want to come after me? Deny yourself. First thing. Teaching there that a person who continues living for himself primarily his way, his will, his desire, trump everything is not following Jesus. It's an impossibility. And so Christian liberty, the teaching of it, the study of it, the embracing of it, the practicing of it involves recognizing that we are free not to be bound by some things that would, that would harm us, but we are free to be sensitive the non-Christians around us, to weak Christians around us, the weaker brother, weaker sister. And we willingly, willfully 
to be like Christ, deny ourselves. Things that we might could legitimately claim as our own. We're going to see this in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians. So that's why I said we're going to be here for a few weeks. And then chapter 11, verse 1. Is, uh, Paul had said, remember in 1 Corinthians 6, when he's, when he's chiding them or taking one another to court, when he's warned them that certain lifestyles lived will mean that they will not inherit the kingdom. He goes down a list of things and you go, oh my goodness. But then we looked at that point, remember? And he said, and such were some of you. There was the encouraging thing there. Yeah, that's your background. It's not who you are. It's your past. It's not your present. He said in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 and 13, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. In other words, there's nothing in life that so has a hold of me, that I let it dominate me. Ask yourself, what do I have to have in this life more than Jesus Christ in order for me to be happy, to be content, to have meaning for life? You see, because whatever you answer is a God that dominates you. If I have to have more than Christ, and we, basically, we just sang a while ago, Christ is enough for me. We have to have something else to make us happy. And the list is, we've talked about this before, you know, I could say, well, I, if, if, my, if my kids just obeyed better, well, I'd be happy. If my wife better understood me, was more, more attentive to my needs. I could be, you start filling the blank. It, it could be a thousand things. What you've said is, Christ is great, but he's not enough. I will be dominated by nothing, he says. Then he talks about food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. In other words, the, the, the person who lives for food... Food will be destroyed, and that person, his stomach will be destroyed, if, if that's what you live for. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. I mean, we were talking about the sexual immorality in chapters 5 and 6. The specific occasion what we're looking at in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 is the question whether Christians should eat meat that had been offered as a sacrifice to idols. That's hard for us to wrap our mind. We don't, we don't think in those terms. But I want you to I'll read you a little background, what was going on, what they would have lived in in the, in the midst of Corinth. Meat sacrifice was at the center of the worship of all of these ancient religions, these pagan religions. And it spilled over into what we would call their domestic life and, and living at home, living socially. Here's the description. After the legs of the sacrifice, enclosed in fat, and the entrails had been burned on the altar, and after the priest had been given his share, by the way, this, is, there's, this happened in Judaism, but it also happened in the pagans. It, it was something they had in common here. Been given his share. What was left of the victim's flesh was returned to the family that offered the sacrifice. So, so you bring the sacrifice, they take it, they ritually sever it. Parenthetically, by the way, the best butchers in the world in that day were the priests. They knew how to cut up the animals and all. Just, and so they would, they would do this and they would burn the portion that was supposed to be burned for sacrifice. They would keep a portion to themselves. They would give the rest back to the family. This consecrated meat was then eaten either as part of a banquet in the pagan temple or its, its surrounding area, or in the worshiper's home, or it was sold at the marketplace. So get the picture here. The meat burned on the altar is not in question here. It's consumed. The meat given to the priest 
he himself could use it to eat, or he could take it and sell it in the marketplace for, for some, some uh, money. You then were given back the rest of the meat. You use to have a banquet in the temple area. You could take that meat and say, I'm going to invite my friends and my family. We're going to celebrate. Or you could take it home and do the same thing. You can see where the challenge is coming, can't you? If the consecrated meat was used for a banquet, whether at the temple or in the worshiper's house, friends and relatives among whom there might well be Christians were invited. Christians would then find themselves confronted with the question of whether they should eat the idol meat. So also, when meats previously consecrated to a pagan deity were sold in the market, Christians might find themselves having to decide whether to purchase that meat. Remember now, the best cuts were made by the priests. This is the challenge you're facing when you read into this. Part of the passage, then this is chapters 8 through 10, relates to the question of whether Christians should eat consecrated meat in a temple setting. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 22. We're going to jump forward. This is the intro today. Look at this. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So he's, he's arguing in the 10th chapter when we get there to think through and have a clear conscience about what you're doing so the meat of the pagan sacrifices offered was served at a meal to which friends and relatives were invited. The temple functioning as a sort of banquet hall. So in the name of Christian liberty, some affirm that it was quite allowable for a Christian to participate in such a festive social occasion. Perhaps using the adage that everything is permissible to me. We just, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, we just read that. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful. But not all things are helpful. So Paul said this again now later on. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Not all things edify. Because what I'm doing, what I'm considering doing, is it going to edify and encourage a brother or sister in Christ? You have the strong and the weak. This language is used. It's used in Romans as well. The strong are the mature. They, uh, they see, whether it's in Romans 14, that... Uh, the Jewish ceremonial law passed away in Christ. They don't need to be caught up with all the, the days, ceremonial days. In the Jewish calendar, you'd have sometimes two or three days a week that were ceremonial days. You had to do ceremonial washings. You had to wash a certain way to be pure and to clean. Uh, so the mature, the strong say, well, we realize what that was, but we're, we're in Christ and we don't, we don't observe those. Well, the weak in Romans 14, would be caught up in that thinking that to turn their back on the ceremonial law would be to turn their back on God. They didn't understand that Christ had fulfilled the ceremonial law. Here, the strong are those who recognize that whether you're, whether you're eating meat in a pagan temple or whether you're eating at home and it was, it was meat sacrificed or whether you have bought some in the marketplace, it's just meat. The weak I came out of that though. I, I used to go to that temple. I can't go back there. Why would my why would my brothers and sisters in Christ go there? Be invited to a home. We're going to celebrate a banquet. Is that meat that was part of the pagan sacrifice? Well, yeah, it is. It's great stuff. My conscience is troubled. I, I don't understand. You see the, the tension there. The strong and the weak. The strong and the weak. 
problem I've seen through the years, studying this for several decades now, trying to teach this to people, trying to help people, is the person who is weak, is, he's not inferior, nothing, but the person who's weak always thought he was strong. Every time I've dealt with this. They have scruples, and they want to superimpose those scruples on others. If I can't, why can you? If I can't, why should you? Dawson Trotman, who was the organizer, the founder of the Navigators, had a statement. Others may, I cannot. It was a, it was a powerful declaration of his recognition that he, he was before God, someone who needed to practice self-denial. And he wouldn't superimpose that on somebody else, say, why don't, why don't you deny yourself? He said, others may, I cannot. It was a, it was a wonderful balancing tension. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 25. Eat whatsoever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, Paul says. If you don't understand what's going on here, you're going to think Paul's talking out of both sides of his mouth. No, he's not. He's addressing a very real tension in the church. 1 Corinthians 10, 27. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. You hear, Paul is speaking as a mature believer here. And this is the principle, and you're going to see this, unless you're doing that, binds the conscience, offends the conscience of a weaker brother or sister. The problem with Christianity in the West is that we think of ourselves first. What about me? What about me? New Testament doesn't teach that. New Testament teaches what about others? What about others? See? And so that's why I'm telling you this is not studied, thought upon, prayed through, embraced to live a life of self-denial. You say, you mean to tell me, didn't you just act like a legalist a while ago when you said you wish the whole Super Bowl would shut down? Well, that's, that's, my, that's my preference, you know. You tell me I can't watch the Super Bowl? I would never tell you you can't watch the Super Bowl. But I would tell you if you've covenanted to be a member here, there's something going on at that time that you covenanted to be a part of. I will uphold the worship. I will not forsake. We just read that together. I'm not binding anybody here. Calling myself up. Be true to my word. I won't be here tonight because I don't like the Super Bowl. I won't be here tonight because I'm getting paid to be here to preach. I'm here tonight because I covenanted with you not to forsake assembling with you. <laughs> it's, it's a foreign concept, isn't it? Foreign concept. And because we don't think in these terms, Western Christianity is so far behind the rest of the world where Christianity has a price to it. We talked about UAE this morning, United Arab Emirates. I promise you, they're not thinking over there, what, what time does that come on today? Or if they're not into Super Bowls, football. F-U-T-B-O-L, football, soccer. They're not thinking, well, when's that going to? No. They're thinking, I hope and pray to God that when I gather with my brothers and sisters in Christ tonight, my neighbors don't rat me out and the authorities don't arrest me. That's what the rest of the world thinks about gathering. The West, because, because Christian liberty means I'll do whatever I please. Don't rain on me. The West thinks you can count on me unless something better comes along. Brothers and sisters, I would never bind your conscience. You are free. If you know Jesus Christ, you're free in Christ. 
My question to you is, how are you using that freedom? And I've got to wrap this up. Galatians 5. Chapter 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. By the way, we went through Galatians several years ago. We told you it's the, it, is the, it is the clarion call to the freedom of the Christian man and woman. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. There's, there's your stay out of the pharisaical ditch. Galatians 5, 13, same chapter. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Here's the question I think we have to ask ourselves over and over. What I'm considering doing, am I giving occasion to the flesh, pursuing the, fl- the lust of my flesh? What I want to do, that, that, that pronoun that is so prominent, I, me, you, you've seen it. People come to church. What does your church have for me? Well, it's got a Bible that we're going to teach you how to say others. You hear this? You were called to freedom. But stay out of the ditch of licentiousness. Licentiousness is not simply immorality. It is not, it is not uh, erotic. It is not only pornography. Licentiousness is doing what I want to do and may it hair lip everybody else. That is not the attitude of a believer. A believer says, how will this affect my brother? Is this going to edify a weaker brother? Is this going to encourage another brother or sister? Is this going to discourage them? my conduct? Am I teaching people that, that being a Christian means I'm covenanted with Christ? That being a member here, I'm covenanted with one another? Is that what I'm teaching? Or am I teaching, nah, it's just words. What are we teaching? Because we're always teaching. We're always teaching. Somebody's always watching. Somebody's always learning. What are we doing? Christian liberty, a proper understanding of what Paul is teaching here, applied to my, to my heart to embrace it and my conscience to be guided by it, makes Christianity powerful. It is powerful. When people see other folks practicing self-denial because Jesus is the Lord of the conscience and more than anything else in life, I want to please my God. I want the smile of heaven. I want to be conformed to Christ. I want the gospel to advance through me. When people see that, that is compelling. That is magnetic. And they do not yawn at such a Christianity. I promise you, the world does not yawn at our brothers and sisters who suffer greatly for following Christ. They don't yawn at them. They hunt them down. They hunt them down. So, will you join me in wrestling with this passage? Chapter 8, verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 1. I pray, dear God, I want, I want to wrestle with this. This is not something that just rolls off my tongue. It doesn't pop up on my screen. I want to wrestle with this until your spirit pins me to the ground with this so that I can be more like Christ, so I can make an impact on my world, my, my neighbors around me. People all around me today, where I live, having Super Bowl parties. I promise you, it'll be hard to get up and down the street in some of these places. Do you know what? I'm having an Obadiah party. I want to read and thank God. He loves his people enough that any enemy that rises against his, his people will be ultimately and utterly destroyed. That's the promise. Obadiah. I want to hear that. I want to know that. I want to, I want to see Jesus in that. 
Not because somebody's got a gun to my head and says, you've got to be there. But my liberty in Christ, my freedom in Christ drives me. Drives me. I want to be like him. Don't be separate from the world. Not an easy passage. We're going to see it, and I'm going to close with this. We're going to realize, as we look at next week, love drives this discussion. I appreciate it so much, Brother Norman, saying we, we're going to start a uh, love others list. A love out loud list. A live out loud. You know, there's a lot of people living out loud. I just assume they shut up. It's, it, the, the noise is frustrating to me because of what they're doing. But Christianity living out loud, that's bold. That's wonderful. Love others. It's part of our agenda here. Follow Christ, love God, love others, serve the world. You're going to see that Christian liberty has limits because of the concern for the progress of the gospel. We're going to see that in chapter 9. That we have to embrace Christian liberty because it has implications for us, for our spiritual well-being. And then we'll look at some practical suggestions toward the end of chapter 10 when we get there. So pray for me. I want to be clear on this. Pray for yourself. We'll all have convictions by the Spirit of God about this. And that we will determine, by God's help, we will not be, we will not be a part of the Western culture that has a cafeteria approach to Christianity. I'll take this, I won't take this. Because Jesus said, you take this, don't take this, I don't take you. You'll be known by God. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, this, this passage here is, uh, it might as well be written in Russian. It's a, it's a foreign idea to us. And yet, Lord, it's in your word. And I confess the temptation to self-indulgence. I confess the temptation to lip service, to following Jesus. But I've just, I confess, it's easy to sing, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, and yet, Lord, times when I'm, when I'm looking back, when I got an eye that way, oh God, help us, cleanse us, come powerfully over us, that we might be the generation. It changes the world, that it might be said of us, just starting right here, these are the folks who've turned the world upside down and they've come here to create mischief also. God help us. And help us, those of us who are adults who say we've walked with the Lord for years, decades, help us to model this to the young ones here, the, 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 our children, the baby believers, the, to let them see that, that following Christ is all in all. Jesus is more than enough. I don't, I don't need the dainties the world offers and dangles in front of me to be satisfied, to be fulfilled. I have Christ. I have all I need. Teach us by your spirit. I don't, I don't want a word of mine. It's just my word. I, I want that to fall like chaff and be blown away. But I want your word, Lord, to pierce and penetrate and transform the image of the Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I stand and sing.